Testing one, two. Testing one, two. Check, check, check. Good, it's working. That's always a plus. <laughs> uh, I always forget if somebody's introducing me or not, but I'm going to guess no, because I don't see anybody that looks authoritative. <laughs> so welcome. It's, it's 9.45, so we'll get started. Welcome. How are you this morning? Great. All right. <laughs> My name is, uh, I'm going to tweak this just a skosh. Okay. Can you still hear me? Great. My name's Adam Beeler, and my title here at the University of Utah is Lecture Demonstration Specialist. Okay, what the heck does that mean? That means I do demos. I'm a resource for uh, the classes. Uh, specific, I was hired for the Department of Physics and Astronomy, and so if the, a teacher would like uh, help showing a principle or demonstrating a concept or wake the students up or see it really does work or whatever, then I uh, hook them up. <coughs> Excuse me. If you guys have any questions during this, please ask. This is for you guys, not for So, oh, we already got one. Yes. What's your name? Adam Beeler. My name is Adam Beeler. And uh, physics involves lots of concepts. Mechanics, motion, forces, heat, optics, uh, magnetism, electricity, um, I'm sure I'm forgetting some fluids, heat transfer, I said heat, I'm getting redundant now. All of those things, it's the study of how things work, how the chair is able to hold you up, why you're attracted to the ground, why you can hear me right now, how come you can see me, and whatnot. I've chosen uh, most electricity theme today, teach you a little bit about electricity. So my goal is to uh, uh, you probably will learn something, sorry, <laughs> but hopefully it's in a fun way. So, uh, and again, if you have questions, just raise your hand and what I get to, I get to. I already know I have too much stuff set up. <laughs> All right, the first one question I have for you is, there's two types of charges in this world, and only two. Do you know what they are? Positive and negative. So we're going to start from the ground up. <clears throat> These two ping pong balls. If I rub them with this hair, this fur, every time the fur comes off of the, the uh, plastic, those charges separate. One of them prefers positive charges and one prefers negative. The, the electrons are more prone to go one way, because one of them says, I'm electron hungry, and the other wants to give them up. So these got charged up negatively. They have more electrons on them now, and what can you tell that Electrons, do they like each other or not? No, same charges repel. That's why there's an actual electrostatic repulsion force pushing these apart. So we couldn't tell just from this that they are uh, positive or negative, but you can tell they're charged because they repel. How do you get the charge off? I'm hearing some touch them. Yeah, if I like, this is a, an insulator, and so it allows charge to, to, it charges up, but it can't, it's not free to move around on it. So when I just touch right here, only that charge, excess charge, can come through me. But there's still charge over here, so if I kind of get all the charge off, and all the charge off of this one, they ought to go back a little better here. There we go. Well, we can do uh, that one better. I'll just skip to this one. This is an electroscope. This is rubber, this is hair. I'll rub these together and when they separate, this is like the ping pong balls, they get charged. I transfer it to here. It's all negative and so it repels. What do you think will happen if I touch it with this metal rod? A little spark, that'd be cool. That has excess negative charges. You think they'll transfer to the rod. And you're right. So we call this a conductor. It allows it charges to flow through it and across it. Do it again. This is plastic. What do you think will happen? So we call it an insulator, like the ping pong balls were. Charge cannot flow across it. 
So some charge might have accumulated right there, but it can't move across it. Wood. Raise your hand if it's an insulator. Conductor? No conductors. So I wouldn't trust your life to insulating yourself with wood. It, it's a better insulator than metal, yes. But not completely. Especially if it's uh, not fully dried, really old, it has more moisture in it. It's a pretty, pretty effective conductor. It will still take some charge away. So there, a little primer about insulators and conductors. You can do this at home. You might have ping pong balls, but I like this way. Take a piece of tape, and I just ripped it off of the uh, roll. So I separated some charges. I'm going to put this one right here for the moment. Do the same thing with the second piece. This one, it just separated charges. I did it the same way, so I expect these to be charged the same. What do you expect to happen when I bring them together? They repel. <laughs> now I feel like a cat. <laughs> yes, they repel. So I don't know what charge they are, but they're the same charge. Now you can do this. I'll come around so you can see what I'm doing. Lay one down. Oh yeah, and learn from experience. Fold over a tip so you can get it back off the table. Stick them together, press them, rip them apart. Now they're neutral again. And all that work, they still fold it over. Okay, now I'm going to separate these two. <laughs> now what do you expect? Because one liked the electrons more than the other when they separated them from each other. And so now they're opposite charges and they attract. So anytime you separate things, you get charges. You've done this before. Let me demonstrate it one more way. Do you think this 2 by 4 of wood is, is positive or negative? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> what do you mean by that? Nothing? Does it have positive charges? Does it have negative charges? They're in balance, so we say it's neutral. Very good. I'm going to charge up this rod negatively, excess negative charges. I'm going to bring it near the 2x4, but I'm not going to touch it. But I thought the wood was neutral. And it is. What the heck's going on there? I know you might not have, you know, cat fur and rubber rods lying around at home, so... <laughs> a little more likely you have a pink flamingo. But in general, rub two things together, and probably one likes electrons more than the other, and you get them charged. This is an oven bag and plastic flamingo. Let's say this is negative. What do you think it does to the negatives in the wood? Yes. Yeah, it repels them and they point away. What to do with the positives in the wood? So it's temporarily charged. So we call it polarized or an induced charge. And then when I remove it, it goes back to being neutral. They like go back to normal. But while it charges near, they kind of whoop. Ah, okay. So you can attract something. And now this is one where you've all done it before. Raise your hand. If you've blown up a balloon and rubbed it on your hair. Yeah. And then what'd you do after you rubbed it on your hair? Stuck it on the wall. Is the wall charged? Not normally. So it's doing the same thing as the 2x4. The charged balloon would induce a charge in the, in the wall. Let's see.
it's not, it's not charged yet. Yes, that was on purpose. <laughs> you have to separate some charges first. Let's just rub it. It works like a charm. Now I use this balloon because that's my favorite type of balloon. Because not only do I use it for electricity, This is a Van de Graaff generator. I need a volunteer. Who'd like to get charged up? Alright, will you come down and help? Alright, let's put you like this. Alright. If you don't want to get shocked, okay. don't touch anything around you, and don't let go. Okay. And you'll be fine. You won't feel a thing. Okay. <laughs> All right, I'll turn it on. Again, this is called a Van de Graaff generator. She can feel it already. It's not painful. I, I plug it in, and all that's doing is running a motor, the motor in the base. And what's that doing? It's, it's turning the uh, belt off of the roller down there. And every time it comes off the roll, it's like tape off the, off the roll, and it gets charged. It separates charges. Long story short, the charges accumulate on the dome. She's touching the dome, and so they accumulate on her. All right, I'm going to ask her to shake her hair. Let's see if we can. No, no, don't put it down. That's the point. I get a mirror, so you, you can see what you look like so far. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Give it a chance. Now she's getting charged with the same charge, they don't like each other. So the best way to get far apart is to stand up and spread out. Are you good? Yeah. Alright. Don't let go, oh well, that's fine. I'll give it a moment or you might get shocked. We're just letting it dissipate off of you. You're probably safe now. Thank you very much. If you don't get a volunteer, you can use pie plates. Okay, I see some cameras out there. Get them ready. This goes quick. I'll count to three. Wow, more cameras than I thought. All right, one, two, three. <laughs> All right, now I'm going to teach you guys about a lightning rod. Why do you put a lightning rod on your house? I heard to attract lightning. All right, let's see. Let's turn this on. So you can think of one of these as water particles in the clouds rub against each other. Separate charges, gets charged up, induces a charge in the ground. Now there's a big electric field, potential difference, voltage. If it's big enough, lightning. So it's all because something gets charged up a lot. That's what we're doing with the Van de Graaff, and it jumps to ground. I know you can't all see it, so let's do it this way. Now what I'm going to do... Let's put it back down. You can hear it at least. And here's my lightning rod. It's really just a pointy object conductor. And if I bring it near, lightning, less likely. You can put it on your house. 
and now the, the line of, of, the, of the story is it allows charge to bleed off. The Van de Graaff can't build up as much charge, so it never gets to as high a potential. It now can only jump that far. And so a lightning rod isn't designed to attract lightning. It's, it's to help not get you struck in the first place. <laughs> There's a, another fun way to demo that. Let's do it this way. It allows charge in that vicinity to bleed off into the air. It doesn't have, have to even be touching it. It just ionizes the air and gives it a conductive path for the charge on there to leak away. I can even touch it with this and not get shocked. <laughs> right. So there's the lightning rod. Now I know not all of you have your own Van de Graaff at home. But you can. A fun fly stick. It's a toy. It's a portable Van de Graaff generator. There's a little motor in here run by a battery, and it literally does the same thing as this belt in the tube. There's a little belt that goes like a rubber band. Charges separate, and they build up on here. So to show that, they come with these really delicate mylar strips that are conductive. We'll see if this one still works. It's been ripped apart. They're really light. So you can start charging this up. Touch it to that, it gets charged. And now, they're the same charge, so they repel. And the force is strong enough to uh, <laughs> overcome gravity. Let's grab a new one. Oh, here we go. Let's try the butterfly. And I can make it go where I want. Sometimes. <laughs> This uh, toy, it's the Fun Fly Stick. I think it was about $30. <laughs> I've seen people make them out of a pop can, you know, and a little motor. Because you know the trick now. You just have to separate two materials to separate the charges. What happens if I touch it? It touches me and the excess charge comes off, drains through me, a conductor. And then it goes back to this because it's attracted through induction, like the 2x4. Touches it, gets charged back up, the same charge, it repels. All right. Let's do... Oh, yeah, let's do that one. All right, more volunteers. We've been doing static charge, and we need to start moving it around and storing it so it's a little more useful. So we're going to start making circuits and allow the charge to flow. I need a circuit. So if you'd like to be part of a circuit, come down. Form a big circle down here and hold pinkies with your neighbor. Come on down. Just make a big circle.
Okay. Can I get in the center? Fifty, please. Thank you. All right. We can learn lots from this. This is called a capacitor. It stores charge. It's like a battery. It's a water bottle full of water. I got a bolt sticking into the water out the top, and aluminum foil around, wrapped around the outside. A, con a capacitor is just co two conductors separated by an insulator. So conductor number one is on the inside, the water and the bolt. Outside conductor, aluminum foil. And they're separated by the insulator, the plastic bottle. So this is holding charge. It wants to get from inside to outside, or outside to inside. And the only way to do that is, I'm touching the outside. If I touch the, in, the top, the inside, I now have a path and charge could flow. Well, I'm not going to do it. I'm going to send it through us. <laughs> so things for you guys to know and learn, to have a circuit and charge to flow, it has to see both sides at the same time, like both sides of a battery. And so if you guys let go or break the circuit, it can't see and nothing will flow. So don't let go. And second, we want it to go through us, our circuit, not leak off. So if you're leaning against the table or touching something, just kind of scooch forward. Who would like to be the switch? I don't know. Okay. Can I hold your pinky? Sure. You can let go. All right. So I'm connected over here, and when she's ready, and we're all ready, we'll have you touch the, <laughs> touch the nail, okay? Are you guys connected? Sure. All right, here goes. Thank you. for being brave. All for science, that's great. Clean that up later. Okay. Uh, a couple things uh, we can learn from that. One, you all screened at the same time. That means when you close the circuit, current is flowing everywhere practically instantaneously. It's not like you flip a light switch on and Oh, these lights come on, and then these lights come on. No, they come on all at once. And why is that? It's not because the charges are spinning around, whizzing around at the speed of light. They're going fast, don't get me wrong. But not the speed of light. It's more like this. This charge says, oh, I, I feel a force. And so it goes like this. Watch this one. And the individual charges do not have to move that fast. But you saw how quickly the wave is transmitted, like dominoes in a sense. But this is even faster. And so that's how, why you feel it all at about the same time. Um, second, you all pretty much screamed. <laughs> and the switch, where's the switch? There she is. She felt the same thing as everybody else did. In a series circuit, it's the same amount of charge that flows through everybody. And so she didn't yell any louder than anybody else. That's another important thing about electricity. In a series circuit, the current, the flowing charge, is the same everywhere. Let's do it uh, more dangerously. <laughs> yeah, volunteers! <laughs> no, I'm just... This is a capacitor. Basically, it's just like that bottle, but inside, internally, the, the, the conductors and insulators are a lot closer together and wiggle and wind. There's a whole lot more area, so this can hold a lot more charge. I'm going to charge it up to about 4,000 volts. Turn on the power supply. This is forcing charges into the capacitor. By the way, I charge the... Uh, the, that capacitor up with the Van de Graaff. I just held it on here for like five seconds and that put charge into it. That's long enough for this. Disconnect it from the power supply. 
And it wants to get from one side, one conductor, to the other. It needs a path. Here's the path. You ready? Let's do it again. Can you focus with the lights off? All right. Charge it up. I'll try to do it when I say three, if that helps you. One, two, spark. But get, it, get it on your burst mode, I guess. Okay, that's long enough. I'll start counting first. Okay, one, two, three. <laughs> you don't want to be touching this one. That would hurt. But that's what the capacitor is for. We can build up this charge and then safety. Yeah, it's, it's fully gone. Okay. Let's send... Uh, yeah, let's do this one. This is a Jacob's Ladder. And this one's lethal as well. So, this is a big bad transformer back here hiding so I, nobody touches it. And I'm going to send uh, 120 volts into it. And 12,000 volts come out. See, that's probably like everybody, whoa. Did you know this was probably about 200, 300,000 volts? The, the, the fun fly stick was probably more than 12,000 volts. Voltage isn't what kills. That's the push. That's what causes charges to start flowing. But the charges that go through something, that's what can kill you. The current. This has a lot higher current. And so it's going to try to break down the air like uh, the Van de Graaff did in lightning and jump across. Let's do it. So it, uh, it has a big enough potential difference to jump down at the bottom where it's close. It breaks down that air, lights it up, heats it up. Which way does hot air go? Up. So the broken down ionized air, it's the conductive air, rises. Well, it's easier to stay in that path, so it goes up with it. Until it gets too far apart and it can't sustain itself. It's too far to jump and it starts over. That's what a Jacob's Ladder is. This is where, uh, you know, you, every proper mad scientist has one of these. <laughs> and you have to laugh maniacally. <laughs> All right. I love when it makes it all the way to the top. This is really fire. You put paper in there. Yes, it burns. Uh, safety? Okay. See, protective shield. It, it helps the air currents not be so wild, so it makes it up longer, but it also safety. So I don't reach in there and burn paper. Sorry. Let's burn something else. There's a piece, a wire I've connected. And again, this is a power supply. It's going to uh, put a voltage across and force charges across the wire. This is to emphasize that not only when electricity goes through air does it heat it up, every time it goes through anything it gets heated up. And usually the skinnier the wire, the harder it is to force the charges through. There's more resistance, it'll get hotter. That's why we have light. The incandescent light bulbs forces charges through the thin wire, it gets hot, glows, and we have light. If you don't encase it in an inert gas atmosphere, a vacuum, though, it reacts with oxygen and burns away. All right. Uh, this one's cooler with the lights out, too, so... So watch the uh, quick process that happens here. You ready? That's why you don't want to touch electricity if you don't know what's going on. Because if that goes through you, the same thing can happen. <laughs> so it glowed. You had light because it heated up. 
but it was too much. It couldn't handle it, and it, it uh, oxidized, got really, really, really thin, and then broke apart and broke the connection. Notice that there was no connection. Current stopped flowing. And that's how old-time fuses work. Well, they still work that way. Circuit breakers are different, but fuses are rated so that if it's rated at 10 amps and you exceed that, that's too much, it breaks, it separates the circuit and current stops flowing and hopefully in time to save your precious equipment over here. That's how a fuse works. Let's do... Now that I'm starting to plug things in, we have the, the current from the wall. It was 120 volts. It's alternating current. It's called AC and DC. AC is alternating current, meaning the current changes directions 60 times a second in America. DC current is direct current, like the batteries, things I've been doing so thus far. And they just go in one direction, always. Well, this one alternates, so I'm going to turn it on. And you see this LED? It powers it. Ooh, oh. What color is it? You sure? It's actually two LEDs, red and green. And half the time the red's on and half the time the green's on. So AC current is like a sine wave. And if the light increases positively and then comes back down to zero. And then goes positive or negative increases back to zero. Positive, negative. And it's doing that 60 times a second. It reaches about 170 volts, roughly, in America. So the red LED comes on when it's positive, and the green LED comes on when it's negative. Oh, let's make it really cool. So I turn it back on. And yeah, you can see when it's positive and when it's negative. Tell it it's alternating. It's red when it's positive and green when it's negative. Notice the black spot in between. The power company is ripping you off. <laughs> technically, uh, no they're not, but technically, yeah, for a split second, you know, there's no power. It's at zero while it's switching from positive to negative. And that's why there's a dark spot. There's no red light, there's no green light. But they're not really ripping you off. <laughs> but it's pretty. <laughs> wow, OK. So that's all AC current. And that's what's coming out of our wall socket. It's just the voltage pushing around the charges. We're just alternating it now. Let's do, right, make a connection with magnetism now. This is one of my favorite demonstrations. Get that out of the way. Turn this on. Do 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 do. Okay. All right. This is an aluminum cylinder. This is copper. Right, I'm going to drop it down in the hollow middle of it. And what do you expect to happen? Good scientists make make predictions. It falls. Ready? Yeah. Okay. You have to do a control. You need to know what, what it normally does before you do the fun part. This is a neodymium magnet, a rare earth magnet. It's pretty strong. Is copper magnetic? Yes. No. Steel is. <laughs> but copper is not. So. There we go. What the heck is going on? I got the video camera here so you can see what's going on. Let's leave this one on. Now you can watch down the middle of the tube. So what's happening is magnets have magnetic fields around them. How many played with magnets? I should do it. Has anybody never played with a magnet? Absolutely. No sense standing here talking while you can watch something, right? Well, the magnetic field, 
the copper feels that magnetic field. It's in that in its presence. Is copper an insulator or a conductor? It's a conductor. It's metal. It allows it charges to flow through it. So what's happening? Well, I'll wait for this one to finish. Is as that magnetic field moves by the conductor, it actually causes charges in the conductor that are already there to start moving. Let me show you that better. This is a coil of wire. This is called a galvanometer, uh, a fancy term for it. It measures very really sensitive amounts of current. It, this needle will move if anything's flowing over here. It'll force it through here too and deflect. So we can tell if charges are moving over here. Magnets, magnetic field, going around. Tell me, is current flowing? How about now? 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 What are you picking up on? Yeah, it's all moving. You have to have a changing magnetic field. There's still a magnetic field. This is still feeling it, but that doesn't move charges around. It has to be changing. And that causes these charges to move one and then maybe another, depending on which way you're moving. And so that's how you can generate electricity. That's what's happening when the magnet goes by that conductor. It causes charges in the copper to move around. You can, this is a generator. I'm making electricity. All generators in this world pretty much have a magnet moving with respect to a coil. You can move the magnet or you can move the coil. It doesn't matter. Or you can move both. How many of you have these, these flashlights? These are those shaker flashlights that don't need batteries. They work exactly like that. Here's the magnet. And actually it looks like the same magnet I was dropping down the copper pipe. And here, the blue thing is the coil of wire. So when the magnet's moving through the coil, we have light. We just connect the coil up through the light bulb, series circuit. And so you shake it, you get light. You stop shaking, current doesn't flow. No light. So this, you're like, that's really useful. I have to walk around like this. Well, they got smart. There's a little switch. Now, no light, but I'm producing electricity, moving charges. Where do you think the charges are going? To a capacitor. We're going to store that charge, just like we've done. All right, that's probably enough for this purpose. Let's now connect the capacitor to the light bulb. Hey, all right. <laughs> and that'll work for uh, a while. And if it runs out, you just shake it some more. Don't need batteries. You get, can produce your own electricity. Similar ones. I give this one to my daughter when we're camping. So one, I don't have to replace the batteries when she leaves it on at night. But I know where she's at, too. <laughs> and this doesn't have a capacitor, but when you do this, all it does is it moves a, it spins a magnet next to coils. It creates current flowing. Yeah. Why did that make the magnet fall so slowly? Yeah, now we, one more and I can get to that. Let me pull out this one. <laughs> We're into 10.30, right? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> That's good, because for a while there, I, I had 15 minutes off. <laughs> All right. Where's those magnets? This is an old CR, old, <laughs> obsolete CRT TVs, cathode ray tube. It shoots electrons from the back, charges, to the screen. They hit phosphors and make them glow. Well, those are moving charged particles. Watch what else a magnetic field does to moving charged particles. They deflect those charged particles. They exert a force on them if they're moving. This magnetic field, which isn't moving, can exert a force on charges if they're moving. And a moving magnet can make charges move. So if a moving magnet can make charges move, the magnetic fields exert forces on moving charges, they push on each other. I'll repeat. <laughs> moving magnets 
urges to move. But magnetic fields push on moving charges. And so any, you push on anything, it pushes back. And the bottom line is it's repelled. It's pushing back up on it and slows it down. Does that make sense? Yes. This is why your parents would say, well, parents, this is what your parents would say. <laughs> Don't stick magnets to the TV. There's a shadow mass behind this that the little electrons go through, little holes. Boom. It's, it's magnetic. It can be magnetized. So when you bring a magnet near it, I just temporarily magnetize that iron. It's now providing the magnetic field and continuing to mess up the TV. That's why you don't want to do this at home. <laughs> Honestly, I haven't tried it with a new TV, the plasmas, because I don't have one yet. <laughs> I don't encourage it, but if you do it, tell me what happens. <laughs> All right. Last demonstration. This is called a Tesla coil. And it uses everything, every principle I just uh, explained to you guys. I, will, I want to bore you with the uh, math, which isn't also always boring, but I don't have time. <laughs> so we are going to plug it in. Here's the switch. So I can turn it on without having my hands not free. 120 volts come out of the wall. It goes over some transformers right here in the front. These things. They step up the voltage through induction, this magnetic field change, except like this transformer. Steps it up to, uh, I think these are 8,000 volts. That was 12,000. They charge up a capacitor. You can't all see it, but there's a big white canister cylinder back here. It's the capacitor stores charge. If it holds enough charge, gets charged up enough like the Van de Graaff, it will complete a circuit. Back here, there's spark gaps. Two electrodes, conductors like this, but they're not touching. Remember, if it's high enough, you know it sparks. Once it sparks, it completes the circuit and dumps its energy into this coil which is not connected to this coil. But it induces a charge, because of a current going through creates a magnetic field, magnetic field creates a current, the electromagnetism, and this acts as a capacitor and charge builds up. That's the gist. This will get up to about a half a million to a million volts. I do want to ask, does anybody have a pacemaker? If you have one, you know. It helps your heart. This can interfere with it if you're too close. I just wanted to Make sure you're not too close. Okay. I'm going to turn off the lights because it's way cooler, of course. And we'll give it a go. Photographers, you can take pictures if you can focus, but don't get too close or you won't like it. <laughs> Where's the remote?
guys have been great. Thanks for coming to Science Day. Thanks. Do you recognize me? Do you recognize me? I was in that photography class. Oh, you were? Uh, no way. Who's there?